So, um, so today, the uh, when pa pa Pastor Trevor asked me to to do a guest uh, preaching, I was thinking about it. I had something prepared, and then I switched because when when you do this, this isn't about you thinking about something like, oh, that's really cool, I want to do that, because the Holy Spirit will often sidetrack you, you know, like two days before you got everything done, and then all of a sudden you get convicted, like, no, nah, come on, God, I, I already did my outline, you can't do that. So, it is a, a supernatural event, and has a lot of prayer to it. So, um, what was on my heart um, was... Uh, it's often hard for us, I believe, to make the scriptures feel fresh, right? You know, when you start doing your own Bible reading, you go to Sunday school and church, you go to a Bible study, yeah, and you're reading, say, the book of John or whatever, it might be the 60th time that you've read a passage or a book, you know, and, and you love it, it's great, but you also sometimes it's so familiar that it just becomes a little bit rote or you or you forget the impact of what was happening say in the gospels to the people in the gospels for the first time that they're experiencing it and hearing Jesus and so i wanted to kind of remind us today about that so the the title is you know the apostle said what what and and um, that's, that's what I want you to kind of try to uh, recapture today. And I'm going to show you multiple examples of how the apostles would ask questions or say things that if you took a moment to stand back and put your first century sandals on, if you were an observer in that crowd, and you knew that they were hanging around Jesus for a long time and saw all the miracles, you'd say, he just asked them, What? Or did they not have their ears open? So, um, when Jesus uh, obviously became incarnate, God incarnate here, divine power, he, God's plan uh, was for him to come and, and forgive our sins, to, to die and to rise, to break the power of death, and he knew that he was going to establish his church here on earth, and he had some options, right? He knew that he wasn't going to be very long on, physically on the earth, and he wanted to establish the church to continue the work of God. And in order to establish that church, he needed, you know, 12 apostles first. Now, obviously, at that time and period of history in that world, God could have done that anywhere. I mean, Jesus could have been born anywhere in the world. They picked the, the backwater of the Roman Empire. This is like the least place you wanted to be as a Roman. I mean, like, uh, Judea was just like, well, I don't want to insult anybody here in West Virginia. Or I, I don't know. If you're from West Virginia, I'm sure it's a great place. <laughs> this is going downhill quickly. But, you know, no matter where, Jesus had lots of options to pick apostles, right? So one route he could have went is go right to the top, you know, pick the most powerful, influential people in that day and age. So one would be, you know, pick the powerful, pick the Roman, pick Pontius Pilate, pick his, uh, the, the commander of the guard, pick uh, uh, a senator who's from Rome, all right? That would give you a lot of prestige, a lot of doors would open, uh, be a lot, of, a lot of good stuff there. You could pick the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the group of Jews who ran the temple, who were kind of the collaborators with Rome. You had the head priest. You could have picked some of those, and that would have given you a lot of clout, little greased things in Jerusalem for you, obviously. The Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish council that basically ran everything uh, from a religious standpoint and had all the old rabbis, and could have, the 12 could have been picked from the Sanhedrin. 
And of course, you had the rich. You know, you had Greek merchants and Roman merchants and people from all over the empire who would, would have their villas out on the, in Jerusalem or out in, uh, on the coast, rich merchants, inter, international people that you know, could speak multiple languages and have connections all over the Roman world. That's certainly one route that he could have taken. All right? And if you were a political person, if this was a political movement, that's probably what you would try to do immediately, is get the most powerful, influential people in your movement. Keep it going. Now, there, there was another way that Jesus could have went and said, well, you know, I'm going to go for, we're going to get all the greatest thinkers and most influential theologians of the day. All right, so you had very famous uh, rabbis in Jerusalem. You know, some of them are mentioned in, in the Gospels, and you could have had one, one or more of those as your disciple. You could have had the, uh, some of the Essenes. This is the, the sect out where the Dead Sea Scrolls were. They were living out by themselves out in the desert, kind of like hyper-Orthodox, you know, we're going we're gonna to remove ourselves from the rest of the Jewish world, and, and they were kind of respected as a kind of a very rigorous cult. Could have, could have had those. And, of course, you could have had the Pharisees. Pharisees, although they were not in charge of the temple, they were very, very influential and powerful with the people. They were the ultra-Orthodox Jews of the day. They believed that uh, the more strict you could follow the Torah rules, the sooner the Messiah would come. And so certainly Jesus could have picked either the rich or the powerful or the theologically influential to be the core of his disciples to begin the church. And would obviously with those connections, it would have been pretty, pretty uh, fast. Or you could pick ordinary schmoes, uh, ordinary people, fishermen. You know, I mean, Sea of Galilee, and you've got the Mediterranean right there. Uh, that was big for uh, small, small time officials, tax collectors, toll collectors, you know, people who are on the bottom rung of society that is barely, you know, they're interacting with some Romans or some, some people from the temple, but the, they are just uh, small-time officials, merchants, carpenters, whatever. So, what does Jesus do? He picks you and me. He didn't pick the theologians, didn't pick the rich, didn't... Uh, pick the powerful and the people in charge. He picked the people on the bottom rung. And some of them, like the tax collector, these are people who are shunned. Okay. So why did he do that? How, how could you build a movement with the lower most rung of society in the biggest backwater of the Roman Empire? Well, there was a plan. There's, I believe, there's a reason. All right. So, in picking the apostles, next slide. Um, it was. It's very interesting. So, if you look at Matthew uh, four, eight, uh, four eighteen to twenty-two, uh, Jesus it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Interesting. If you were on the shore of that, or if you were the friends of these guys, and you're kind of doing your net, and here comes this rabbi, this itinerant rabbi by himself, and he calls out to these people and says, come, follow me. 
and they immediately drop what they're doing. This is their livelihood, right? They drop what they're doing, and they follow him. So it was a command, like, follow you, follow me. And they did. So it was not by accident. I mean, Jesus did not put up a, a table at the local event and say, hey, I got a new thing coming. Who wants to sign up? Okay. And did they really know what they were signing up for? All they heard was, follow me, and it was an irresistible command. There had to have been some reason that these people were picked. So I thought that was very, again, to try to make it fresh. Imagine you're on that shore, and you're watching this, and you know this person because you fish with them, and all of a sudden they just leave their nets and their boats, and they're following the sky that you don't know. What is that about? So who were these apostles that Jesus picked? So at least four to, to uh, six of them, with the details that we have in Scripture and stuff, uh, were fishermen. Fishing, you know, just regular fishermen, casting out nets in the Sea of Galilee. Um, not rich, very poor, uh, very hard work. One was a tax collector, you know, Matthew, and one was a zealot, who's kind of like a revolutionary, kind of like a, a wild-haired guy who's like, oh, you know, we just got to get rid of Romans. I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm just frustrated. So none of these were powerful, none of these were rich, none of these were theologically significant in their society. So the interesting one that I wanted to show you here, there's an example of how people thought of those apostles in their society. All right. So in Acts, the story goes a bit, but in Acts 4.13, when Peter and John are in front of the Sanhedrin, remember the Sanhedrin is the council of the Jewish elders who basically make decisions and they decide court things and Essentially, they, they run the, chit, the temple through the Sadducees. So this is the top of Jewish society underneath the Romans. And they have all the old rabbis and sages in there. And so when, when the Sanhedrin, so this is basically describing what the, the Jewish elders in that Sanhedrin heard and thought when Peter and John were, were in front of them and they were talking. It says, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, I usually don't do this, and I usually uh, <laughs> counsel Trevor, don't, don't put too much Greek and Hebrew in, in, the, <laughs> uh, in the pulpit. Uh, it doesn't really usually add a whole lot. But here, I, I'm going to break my own rule. Okay? So when it says that Peter and John were uneducated, untrained men, the Greek in that is uh, agrammatoi, which is without letters, meaning they can't read or write. They're illiterate. So the Sanhedrin, these people were talking to him like, wait a minute, this is a, probably a fisherman. This is, a, I guess, they're fishermen. Look at their hands, and they're all wizened and cut up. And we know they can't read or write. So that means they can't read the Torah. They can't write down anything. And then the untrained in, in Greek is idiote. They're idiots. That's where we get the word idiot from through Latin. But it didn't mean exactly what we call an idiot today. Idiot means an untrained yokel local. You weren't a scribe, you weren't part of the court, you weren't a rabbi, you didn't go to school, you didn't know any literature, you didn't know any poetry, you're just an idiot. You're just a local rustic. Who are these guys? I know that they were with Jesus, but what gives? What gives? How, could, how could these people be in front of us and say the things that they're saying? 
So again, you're trying to hear this with new ears. Imagine if you were in that Sanhedrin in the back row, one of the servants of the great rabbis, and you're listening to these two, fish, these two fishermen that you know are illiterate, that are idiots, saying things that are amazing, the sages. Wow, that's, that's really something else. I believe that Jesus picked those disciples because they were stand-ins for us, right? They would go ahead and have every emotion, ask every dumb question, make every stupid supposition, have every fear that we have, and generations before us and generations to come, right? We're all fallible human being, we're sinners, we're saved by a savior, but we're not fully sanctified. So we still have baggage, we still have fears, we still react from emotion, even though we know what Jesus says and what he teaches and what he means, it's hard to do because you're human sometimes. And if you want examples of that, just look what the apostles did, okay? So next slide. I, I want to go through a couple examples of when you read this with fresh ears, with that mindset, it starts to kind of give more of an impact. Okay. So next slide. So the events on the lake. There's a, there's a passage in Mark uh, where the disciples are in a boat on the lake and Jesus is asleep in the back. And a storm comes up, and it's, it's about ready to swamp the boat. And so Mark says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we're drowned? All right, think about that for a second. They have been with the Son of God now for a couple of months, year, whatever. They've seen him do miracles. They are, they are beginning to understand that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He has cured the blind. He has, he has powers over the world. And they wake him up. And what's their first reaction? Don't you care about me? Don't you think that that's... I've seen in my own life. You know, even as a strong believer, as someone who studies Scripture... When something out of the blue happens to you that's very fearful, your first reaction sometimes isn't, oh, that's okay, God's got it. It's like, God, where are you? Don't you care about me? Why would you let this happen? This can't happen. Where are you? One of my uh, favorite authors uh, outside of scripture is C.S. Lewis. Um, and he wrote a very slim volume, uh, which is a good, easy read. Uh, at least from a volume standpoint, uh, called a Grief Observed. He, he was a lifelong bachelor, and uh, he married a woman so that she could stay in the UK. <laughs> so it was kind of a weird marriage, but he fell in love. And so he was the happiest in his life, and the woman got cancer. And went through her mission, and then got it again, and she died. And it crushed him. Now here's a man with great, great faith, a great apologist, one of the best in, uh, in the last couple hundred years, and he wrote this journal because he was going through all this swirl of grief and anger, and, and at one point in the beginning, he says, you know, it's not so much that I fear that I'm losing faith that God is there, but I know there's a God. What I fear is that I'm starting to believe that he doesn't care. Because I'm asking for relief. I'm asking for a miracle. I'm asking to take this grief away. And I'm knocking on the door, but I'm not getting any answers. He's there all the time when I don't need him. And now when I need him, knock, knock, knock. Silence. Human emotion, right? It, it, when you're scared, when you're grieving, it's hard to remember. You know, and this is a perfect example. You know, here you got the disciples. Their first reaction is, don't you care about me, God? 
Well, of course, Jesus calms the water. But you can see that same emotion is with us today. Okay? You see, this is so in this example, the, the apostles were standing for us. We still struggle with that. Another one is, uh, again, uh, uh, on the lake, on the sea. In Matthew, he talks about how uh, Jesus was walking on the water to the boat, and the winds were whipping, and they're, they're looking out, and they say, what? Is, that, is that a ghost? And they say, oh, no, that's Jesus. That's our master. He's walking on the water. All right, so that in and of itself is pretty amazing, right? It's a miracle. And they've seen him do miracles. So that's great. So, so Matthew then relates. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, Jesus. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. So now not only is Jesus walking on the water, Peter's walking on the water through the power of Jesus. All right, if you just stop right there, that would be a sign that you're with the Son of God. You're with someone who has control over the physics of this world. God, right? What happens? The very next verse. But when he saw the wind pick up, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? So again, even with Peter walking on the water, which doesn't happen every day to anybody, he gets scared when he sees something out here. He's afraid that something bad's going to happen. His faith wavers. He starts sinking. Now, you can read a whole lot into that passage. There's a lot of, you build a whole message around that, how, how God is doing the work, not you. But in this case, imagine you were a passenger on that boat and you saw that. Even after you're participating in a miracle, the fear overcame Peter. The doubt overcame Peter. So, in a way, it's It's human. It's, it's a human reaction when you're really under stress, when you're really feared. Often we don't immediately turn to God or we start doubting. And, and the apostles were an example of some of that during the, the ministry. But, you know, each one of these are resolved by Jesus. God always delivers. Sometimes not in the way you think, but he does. Next slide. There's also a theme that when you look through, you know, you're looking, again, putting your first century sandals on, you're trying to understand, you know, what kind of questions are the apostles asking Jesus as, as he goes along in his ministry. And you detect a couple places where the apostles themselves are kind of preoccupied with rank and hierarchy. Okay. So it's really about prestige. So in Matthew 18.1, um, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in this kingdom of heaven? Now it's a natural question, a human question. So is there rank? You know, who, who, who's the best? Who's going to be the best? Now Jesus, of course, brings over a child saying, you know, this is an example of who's the greatest. The lowest shall be the highest. The youngest shall be the uh, put up. But it goes, it gets even worse because then later on in Mark 10, 35, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Okay. And so Jesus says, What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other sit at your left in glory. 
So they're asking for the special seats in heaven next to Jesus on his left and right. That's their preoccupation at that point. Had they not heard the Sermon on the Mount? Had they not heard Jesus' teaching? Why would you, you, the least shall be the greatest, not the ones who have the best seats. Okay, can I reserve the seat next to you? Because, you know, I, I really want to be visible. That's such a human, egotistical thing to ask the Son of God who's standing right next to you. But they're human. They're asking these questions because we ask these questions. And Jesus will answer them. And then he goes on to say, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered, completely ignorant. You know, Jesus knows what's coming. Can you walk the road that I'm going to walk? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> there are times like that. If you were as part of that crowd standing around, you'd be like, hmm, okay. So, there's a, a, an evolving hierarchy in these disciples. They're trying to jockey for, like, I want to be the best guy. And then finally, in Luke 22, um, at the Last Supper, this is the Last Supper. So they've been through the ministry. They've heard this preaching. They've seen all the miracles. They've heard the parables. <laughs> it starts, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. I'm like, do you get it at this point? You know, to, those are things that to me, as I read it or as I, as I hear it, those are kind of put new ears on and like, wow, they actually were disputing among themselves who was going to be the greatest? Wow. Now, I go to my, uh, my namesake, which is Peter, right? And, and Peter is always known as the brash person who couldn't keep their mouth shut. So the title of my slide is Peter, um, open mouth, insert foot. Um, at one point when uh, he's with Jesus in, uh, in Matthew 16, he says, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So what does Peter say? Opens mouth, engages tongue, puts the brain back, doesn't remember anything that Jesus has been teaching him, and just reacts and says, Peter took him aside and said, began to rebuke him, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter loves him. It's his master. I'm not going to let that happen. That's not going to happen. And Jesus turns and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, that was a very, very sharp rebuke. He's not literally calling him Satan. He's calling him the stumbling block, the accusers. Like, no, don't get in front of God's plan. And you couldn't do it anyway. And you're, you're, you're looking at this through human eyes. Right? Like a human apostle. Just like our natural instinct is to first look through things in human eyes. And then uh, a little later in Luke... Uh, Peter says, but he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. You know, Peter is sincere, but Jesus knows what is going to unfold. And so Peter is an example of you know, not being in sync yet with God's plan. 
The, uh, and, and the ultimate is the, in John, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Romans are guard is going to come and, and get Jesus. Peter's there with a couple of apostles. And so the, the Romans with Judas say, all right, here's, here's the guy. All right, let's take him. And they, they try to seize him. And so what does Peter do? Peter becomes Peter. It says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So all that teaching, all that foreshadowing about I must die and be raised again, that is the plan. All the things about loving your enemy, praying for your enemy, love those who hate you, in about a split second went out the window and out comes a sword. That's Peter. <laughs> Knee-jerk reaction. This is our base, the flesh part of us, the scared part of us, the angry part of us that is just reacting. The old part of us, the old man, not the new man. And it continues even after Jesus' death. So in the resurrection, in John 20, 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Let me stop right there. So Jesus, who they knew was the Messiah, who they, they, they thought, yeah, you're the son of God. You're the one that's going to save Israel. You're the one. You're the one. And he gets killed, and he's in the tomb. What are they doing? Are they celebrating? Are they waiting for him to come? No, they're scattered. They're hiding behind doors. Why? They are scared. They're scared of the human, of the Romans, of the Jews, of the Jewish leaders. And then, of course, the resurrected Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Like, relax. This is what I told you would happen. In John 20... You have, you know, the ultimate uh, human reaction sometimes. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is one of the disciples. This is one of the apostles. He had to have physical evidence before he really believed this story that Jesus was actually resurrected. So you look at this and it's like, wow, you know, how did Jesus make it through his ministry with these people that he picked? And how did the church grow from these seeds, from these fallible people that were scared half the time, were ignorant, couldn't read or write, would usually make the, you know, say the wrong thing at the wrong time? You know, I often, when I, when I read some of these passages, I feel like I want to go like this. But I know Jesus didn't do that, but I do. I'm like, don't you get it? Now, we get it because we, ha we have the picture. But they do get it. And this is the moral of the story. So, uh, last slide, Peter and the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus told them uh, in his resurrected body, he said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you uh, an advocate to help you and he will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. That is the Holy Spirit. So he's promising them, everything I've ever done, everything I've ever said, everything I've ever taught you, uh, you will understand the advocate will come and teach you all things. 
So at Pentecost, you know, they're hanging around Jerusalem waiting for this advocate. Peter and, and a couple of the disciples are standing up on the stair, and there's a big crowd there. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and descends upon Peter and those disciples. Peter starts talking, and the crowd is amazed because the crowd consists of Jews and Greeks and Syrians and people who speak all different languages from across the Roman Empire. And in Acts 26, uh, Acts 2, 6, it says, When they heard this sound, that is Peter, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So here's Peter, the illiterate idiot, who is now speaking simultaneously multiple languages in native languages to the people who are hearing this. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is now truly upon him and in him. And in Acts 2, 41, the result is those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. So the illiterate fisherman who's an idiot baptized 3,000 believers in one day. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God. Right? You're not doing this by yourself. The apostles, those questions were help us understand our own questions. They ask all those questions. They have all those fears. But you also see that those fears and the understanding are overcome and the understanding is done by the Holy Spirit. When you're a believer, when you, when you surrender yourself to Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells in you, and anything is possible. Nothing is possible without God. Everything is possible with God. So the key points I wanted to bring out today, one is encourage you to, at times, just take a step back, put on fresh ears, and things that you thought weren't all that important, put yourself into the story and see what it would have sounded like to the people standing around. Um, and, and it'll help you refresh your understanding, the impact of Scripture. Secondly, uh, the apostles were chosen as our stand-ins. They were not super theologians. They were not super rich people, super powerful people. Some couldn't read or write. They were us. And then they became the chosen, right? They, they became indwelled with the Holy Spirit. They asked all the questions we ask and had the same fears. True understanding and power comes from the Holy Spirit indwelling in believers. That is the, the bottom line. So... As we think about this, I, I just urge you in your studies, in your readings, in your Bible studies, take a fresh set of ears, put on a first century sandals, and put yourself in the crowd and see what it would have sounded like to them because the impact is usually much greater than when we just read and read and read and read it because you read it for the 60th time. But it's a, a message for us that the Holy Spirit is going to educate us, we'll be there, God is there, he's not, he does care, and he sent his son to save us, and belief in that son will give you eternal life. That is the message. I'd like to close with prayer. Dear Lord, we are so unworthy of the gift that you've given us of your son, to die on that cross, and then to conquer death and resurrect. He knew what he was doing when he was choosing those apostles and then superpowered them with the Holy Spirit to build the church that we today, 2,000 years later, are so privileged to be a member of this body of Christ around the world that is the the salt and light of the earth, that, that is the, the lamp unto a fallen world, that you will come back someday and put right 
You have conquered death for us, and we so love you for that. And if there's anyone who hasn't partaken of that today, I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them to, to really understand the sacrifice that Jesus has done to say that Jesus was who he said he was. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh and paid the price for us. And since he's paid that price and we believe he is who he says, we will have eternal life. All tears will be dried. Every knee will be bent. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.